Hello and good morning from Rockland. I'm your host, Thomas Stockton. Coming up on today's programme, COVID-19 update as cases of Omicron are detected in the EOHU. The municipality of Russell provides online summaries. Clarence Rockland Library closes due to COVID. Volunteers come together in Hammond to talk climate action. Could a local food portal be the answer to rising grocery costs? and a new warden for the United Counties of Prescott Russell. After a turbulent 2021, the reign of Mr. Stefan Sarazeng as warden for the United Counties of Prescott Russell has come to an end. As the mayor of Alfred Plantagenet steps aside, he has other targets for 2022, as he'll be seeking the provincial seat for Glengarry Prescott Russell this year, as he looks to take that next step in his political career. Filling in as the warden for 2022 will be Mr. Daniel Lafleur, Mayor of Castleman, who was sworn in at the United Counties Chambers in Lorignal on Thursday evening. Constaté au cours de la dernière année, les soins de longue durée sont très essentiels dans notre communauté. C'est pourquoi que je m'engage à continuer avec mes collègues à déployer de tous les efforts nécessaires pour que la construction de la résidence de prescott Russell continue à progresser rondement. I will always support the implementation of the prescott Russell Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan. This community initiative is a crucial important to our most vulnerable communities and it is a high priority for me. Je m'engage également à soutenir le développement économique régional. La majorité de nos communautés connaissent une forte croissance. Nous devons donc assurer de, mettre, de mettre tout en place pour, pour leur permettre de continuer à créer des emplois, créer des opportunités d'affaires pour nos entreprises en croissance. Pour y arriver, on doit offrir des solutions pour faire face à la pandémie ou à la punérie, excusez, de la main d'œuvre. On doit améliorer l'accès à l'Internet de haute vitesse. On doit également s'assurer de travailler avec les réseaux de la troisième phase électrique, le gaz naturel. I, I am looking forward to maintain excellent relationship with our neighboring community. In this uncertain time, we must work with Stormont Dundas and Gary, Cornwall, and the city of Ottawa, as well as all other Eastern Ontario community to address any potential regional concern. This will also mean advocating for Prescott and Russell through the Eastern Ontario Caucus, uniting the voice of the Eastern Ontario community is a key in ensuring we are heard in Queen's Park and Parliament Hill. C'est ainsi que je compte faire avancer les nombreuses priorités de nos communautés et, et ce, tout en continuant de promouvoir l'unité au sein du Conseil et de défendre les intérêts régionaux. Je tiens à souligner l'excellent travail de la direction, de l'ensemble des employés des comtés unis de prescott Russell. Au cours de la dernière année, j'ai eu la chance de côtoyer des employés passionnés, dévoués, qui travaillent jour après jour pour les résidents et les résidentes de la région, ayant accès à des services de grande qualité, indépendamment 
des circonstances. J'ai bien hâte de travailler encore plus, plus en proximité avec vous au courant de la future année et de réaliser de grandes, de grandes choses. Merci à tous ceux et celles qui se sont déplacés ce soir et qui se sont joints à nous virtuellement. C'est avec un grand honneur, fierté et humilité que j'accepte d'assumer la présidence des comtés unis de Prescott Russell pour l'importante année à venir. Alors que nous continuons de vivre avec la cons les conséquences et les incertitudes de la présente pandémie, je m'engage à travailler sans relâche pour le bien de l'ensemble des, des communautés. En terminant, j'aimerais souhaiter à tous les résidents et les résidentes de Prescott Russell un très joyeux temps des fêtes. Wishing you all a happy and healthy new year. Merci beaucoup. M. Lafleur, président des comtés unis je tiens à vous, euh, vous féliciter et je vais dire quelques mots, euh, de, 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 quelques conseils. Après, avant tout, euh, je veux juste remercier euh, M. Stéphane Sarrazin hein, pour son... Euh, C'est important de le souligner, on a eu de la misère avec les Stéphane. Euh, je tiens à, à vous remercier pour euh, votre travail, c'est un plaisir de, de travailler ensemble euh, durant cette année euh, difficile. Euh, et M. Lafleur, ça fait longtemps qu'on se connaît et, euh, et j'aime ça vous entendre parler de, de la pénurie du main de la main d'œuvre. Et je pense que ceux qui parlent de la pénurie de main d'œuvre, on parle aussi de l'accès au logement et on parle aussi de l'accès à l'Internet. Toutes ces trois choses-là vont ensemble et euh, vous allez avoir un appui au niveau fédéral. Et je vais faire tout ce que je peux dans mon possible pour vous donner un bon coup de main. Et, euh, et comme président des comtés unis, vous agissez un peu comme pilote. Euh, des fois, la route peut être glissante. Des fois, la route peut être enneigée et vous avez le rôle de, de piloter votre conseil dans une voie unie. Et je vous souhaite euh, ma collaboration et je vous souhaite un grand succès parce que votre succès est mon succès et c'est le succès de notre communauté. Alors, merci beaucoup et bonne chance. 2022 Warden Lafleur there, who uh, I mistakenly said he wasn't filling in. He will just be taking over the reins, of course, and he's looking forward to seeing the job that he and the rest of the council do in 2022. And you heard, obviously, from MP Francis Drouin, although the bulk of it was in French for the Anglophone listeners out there, it was essentially thanking the support he got from his colleagues for the election for 2022, as well as highlighting some of the key areas they'd like to focus on, albeit mainly being, pardon me, uh, long-term care centres, uh, congregate living going forward, affordable housing, as well as internet, all, all topics that MP Francis Drouin underlined himself as well. Uh, obviously, one of the other big topics is the pandemic, as that isn't going away. So let's take a look at the COVID-19 situation in our region at the moment. At the time of recording, there were 51 active cases in the United Counties of Prescott Russell, of which 17 were in Clarence Rockland. Much like across the rest of the province and the country, COVID-19 cases are on the rise and the seven day rolling average, as you can see, is now up to 43.1 in Prescott Russell. Vaccination rates are slowly creeping up too, with 80% of the local population now fully immunized, with 85% partially vaccinated. We're also now approaching close to 20,000 booster shots as well. With Omicron stealing all of the headlines and threatening to put a very real damper on the festive spirit, Dr. Paul Romeliotis, the medical officer for the Eastern Ontario Health Unit, spoke of the plan to help stem the spread. If you haven't got vaccinated, get your first dose, get your second dose. If you get your first dose, it's not going to protect you against Omicron. Your second dose will protect you somewhat, but then you'd need a third dose. But there were that's important, and we're continuing our you know our first and second dose uh, to five plus population in our area. Uh, obviously, um, limit gatherings. Again, use common sense. I know the holidays are coming. Um, we know we want to be able to um, uh, tell people that you know. Uh, you can get together, but know who you're getting together with. Like, know who's fully vaccinated in your entourage. Know, make, you know, make common sense decisions. Uh, if you uh, are going to be with vulnerable people, if you if you must get together, then, you know, you wear masks, physically distance, and so on. But keep it to a small numbers. 
less ten or less is, is what I would prefer. What I would be, what I would sort of see. Uh, limit non-essential travel, and again, that that is something that you need to do a risk assessment. Like, is it important for you to go? Uh, what are going to be using? Is it? It's probably safer to get in your car and drive uh, because you know who's in your car. Whereas if you go on a train or a plane or a big bus with other people, again, you don't know who you know who's around you and how well they're wearing their masks and so on. So again, use your common sense, limit non-essential travel as much as you can within the context of what I just said. And obviously it's very important to wear a properly fitting three-layered mask and, and maintain physical distancing. That's quite important. And, you know, I, I, uh, the other thing too is what we're looking at as well in terms of, you know, what's going to happen in the future and what can, you know, what we'll be saying is um, uh, you, we're going to be looking at um, uh, the masking and looking at perhaps we can limit the uh, removing the masking in, when, in, when you get to public places and so on. So those are the things that we can look for. So what may happen in the near future? What are we uh, looking at um, that uh, may be announced today? Or, or over the next coming days, there has been talk about uh, because of the fact that we know that uh, we need to get this get people third dose vaccinated quicker because of the uh, impending threat of Omicron, which is here already. But we just want to make sure that you know it does not um, you know uh, wreak havoc uh, among the uh, particularly the elderly. We want to uh, we might move we might move the again. This is some these are speculations and these are possibilities that I know that Nasty and others are looking at. Uh, looking at making the dose between um, the interval between second and third dose shorter. Um, again, looking at um, interval between first and second dose in children shorter. Right now it's eight weeks. Uh, decreasing the age of booster eligibility. That's going to happen already. Uh, we know that uh, by January 4th, um, 18 plus are going to be put there as well. Um, increased provincial public health measures, including, uh, again, like I talked about, proof of vaccination mandates, expanding to other areas, um, capacity and social l gathering limits. Those are the things that we need to be looking at uh, that may be required. Like I said, you need those. I'm not talking about a lockdown or anything like that. I'm just talking about just de decreasing it a bit to de to limit the contact with between people. Because as you saw, it's unbelievably infectious. And so, you know, the more people that are together, the more it's going to spread, right? The, that, and that's the bottom line that we're trying to do. At, to, just to buy us time so we can vaccinate, you know, the, the vast majority of the population. Enhanced measures for long-term care and retirement has already been implemented in terms of um, uh, making sure that individuals are vaccinated when they go in testing with uh, with the staff and so on so that's already there and again these what may happen will change and vary and will pivot and move or you know from one position to another depending on how the omicron um, um, you know uh, uh, expresses itself for lack of a better word uh, in in the in our province and so stay tuned for that uh, and uh, I think that uh, we'll uh, uh, we'll we'll be able to like I'm not panicking, but I, I am I'm concerned that we need to get the vaccine done in the interim. We need to take those measures. So Dr. Paul there obviously talking about some of the new measures coming in since that clip was recorded. It was earlier on in the week. NASI have changed their recommendations. If you are 18 years old and above and you received your second dose of the COVID-19 vaccine more than three months ago, as of this week, yeah, as of the 18th of December, you can book your booster shot as well. Again, that is not mandatory, but it is definitely something that's being suggested. And you can head over to our Facebook and YouTube channels to hear that full press conference from Dr. Paul Rumeliotis explaining the real benefits against this new variant, Omicron, when it comes to actually getting that resistance from your third dose. Um, but when and how will this end? is a question I'm sure many of you have on your lips and at times I do too. And as we approach a fifth wave and the third year of this pandemic, I asked Dr. Rumeliotis just that. First of all, Thomas, everybody thinks that and I, I think that as well. So it's, it's a natural thing to ask, you know, when's this gonna end? It's going into third year next year. And so um, I do believe that at one point we're going to live with COVID, all right? We're going to live with it. We're going to have enough people vaccinated, uh, have enough people with some immunity to previous versions of it that we're just going to live with it. It's not going to overwhelm our system. When will that happen? I don't know. But this is what I call our road to endemicity, a road 
to uh, being able to live with it. And so the Omicron has kind of put a bit of a wrench in that because it's kind of taken over so quickly. Um, but it's accelerated the process. It's accelerated that in, in that in many, it, it's already here. So what are we going to do about it? Um, you know, we're not going to lock down. We're not going to close down everything again. Uh, but we are trying to get out of this. We are going to perhaps have an annual vaccine. I'm not sure. We, we might have to live with it like the flu, uh, but not to the extent that, you know, every time we get outbreaks and big surges that we're going to have to close down the society. And, and I, if you ask me when we would do that, pre-Omicron, I would have told you probably would be in the spring sometime. Um, but now I'm not sure, and, and I'm not ruling out that it, it's you know, not going to be in the spring, that we'll able to, you know, be a bit more relaxed about cases. Although, uh, I want to say that even if we are at the place where we're saying, okay, we can live with it, uh, you know, we've got enough people vaccinated, and we've got, you know, an annual dose or whatever it is, there's always going to be the threat worldwide. And and as long as there's that threat worldwide, because people are not as vaccinated as high rates as we are uh, in some, you know, in some developing countries, there that's where the, the viruses are going to start to mutate. That's that, when you, when you get a lot of infection, a lot of, a lot of naive people or people who are vulnerable, um, the viruses, that's where they mutate. So as long as that's a threat worldwide, we're still going to have to be, you know, more of a high alert, but I do believe we'll have to live with it at some point. So, you know, it's an, it's natural to think that way, but uh, I, I still think that we're headed in the right direction. And I also want to say Thomas and people who are listening to this now, um, and is that we're in a much better position Today, uh, December 15th, as we were last year, yesterday was the first anniversary, one year anniversary of the first dose administered in Ontario, you know, and we've come a long way, you know, we've now we, you know, from one dose, we've, we've double vaccinated, you know, close to uh, uh, almost 11 million people in Ontario. And so we have a baseline of protection. So it's not that we're we're completely completely vulnerable or what we call immunologically naive to uh, new variants. We have a baseline that we can act with that will require perhaps less measures and ever increasingly less measures. Let's put it this way: as we move forward uh, with with living with uh, with COVID. Again, I, I was planning, I was hoping to you know have this roll out as an endemic in March sometime. Uh, but I think it might be pushed a bit. But again, depends on what Omicron does. If if Omicron kind of just burns itself out and you know just infects a lot of people, but nobody gets hospitalized, that it'll it'll be a quicker uh, point to the endemicity at that point. There we go, Dr. Paul explaining a little bit more there. A member of staff at the Clarence Rockland Public Library has tested positive for COVID-19. The staff member, who is double vaccinated, is said to have mild symptoms, attended work on Monday the 13th, and all the colleagues who she came into contact with are currently isolating, awaiting test results. None of them are symptomatic. The EOHU is said to not be worried about the exposure to the public, as the library has followed all public health measures in place. The library is set to be closed as half of their staff are currently isolating, but could reopen as early as next Tuesday. As many of you have probably heard, the cost of your weekly grocery shop is set to get a little bit higher come the new year. Earlier this week, I spoke to Tom Manley, the executive director of the Eastern Ontario Agri-Food Network, about how their food portal, which allows consumers to shop locally straight from the local farmers online, could help you cut some costs in the new year. Aside from the normal rate of inflation, uh, yes, the food system, as every other supply chain in the world, is being affected by disruptions and various issues. Individual farmers do not set market prices. Even small group of regional farmers do not set market prices. Food, like hardware for snowmobiles and skis and bicycles and clothing and everything in between, are affected by worldwide supply and demand, including the manufactured supply, the actual demand, and the disruptions and supply chains in between. So yes, consumers and farmers are faced with those same um, issues as every other industrial sector. So how can consumers adapt to it? Is relationships, find the local farmers, find the resilient supply chain, find the local abattoir and meat shop and so on, so you can be somewhat um, safer from international supply disruptions. 
Secondly, look at buying scenarios with local farmers, such as bulk buying. Instead of buying a, a, a roast once in a while or a hamburger once in a while, buy a mixed box. I personally do that. It costs me much less per pound to buy a mixed box twice a year in my freezer. It's always there. I can get along with an, inter an interruption supply momentarily, and it costs me less. The same thing goes with bulk supplies of fruits and vegetables. So my household, we get our peaches from Niagara area once a year, and then we preserve them for the rest of the year. And we have wonderful Ontario peaches that taste great in our own preserves. Yes, it takes some time. And I think people want to have a re look at the shift in their time versus their money and replace some of the time uh, money being spent on expensive supplies with some of their own time being put in with bulk purchasing, advanced purchasing, and some preservation of foods in their own home. So would you say that potentially this increase in inflation towards agri-products affected by the global supply and demand chain, as you mentioned earlier, could actually be a sort of hidden benefit for local producers? Absolutely, because they can detect that consumers are wary of interrupted international supply lines. Consumers are paying attention to local supplies. Local farmers right now are largely sold out. They're running out of own production capacity and they're trying to scale up, but they're, they're struggling with capital. They're struggling with labor. And we can talk about labor and agriculture. It's a common challenge as everywhere else, uh, but they're trying to scale up. And we see new farmers coming into the farming system, either as second next generation farmers, kids who grew up in farms who are moving into a farming uh, job or second and third career farmers coming out of other sectors of the economy and taking over a, a livable farm uh, and, and marketing produce, livestock and vegetables to their own local consumers. So we see a ramping up of uh, that situation. We see a shift in that organization as people are paying attention to it. Yeah, and you mentioned workforce there, which is one of the biggest issues. We know that, uh, that we know that there's a couple of local organizations looking to utilize immigration specifically to help supply that, to help supply that um, the, the English phrase that escapes me all the time, but la pénurie de main d'oeuvre qualifiée in, in, the, in the region. So how big an impact does that have on local prices as well as the ability for local, the, the local agri-industry to expand not having the, uh, the, the kind of workforce that's required. That's right. Uh, so I've spoken to operators, abattoirs, uh, milk processors, farmers who are prepared to scale up, who would, who, who would like to respond to that new demand and can't, and they're holding back for lack of labor. Uh, and that's a dilemma. Uh, where are the people? Where are they? They're working somewhere. They're busy. They're busy with family. The COVID pandemic has forced a lot of people to stay home for various reasons. And the homeschooling situation of the last year with, with schools being closed or interrupted and, and uh, quarantines happening and so on, the, food, the labor situation is interrupted for all industries, including agriculture. Uh, you've heard the news. Uh, we heard that uh, St. Alba Cheese is short 25 workers. And I know other operators in a similar situation who don't have enough people, who lose people to more alluring jobs and better pay. So there is a very strong competitive situation for jobs right now. And farmers and food producers are suffering from it as well, not just international large scale players. Um, so we beg patience uh, uh, for the consumer. Um, we, we beg patience for workers and for operators. Uh, we'll get through this. Uh, but yes, we are hurting for it. And what's the solution here? Because, I mean, as you say about the St. Albert Cheese Factory example themselves, I mean, it's not like they're not offering competitive pay or competitive remuneration packages in themselves, but especially a lot of young people are being drawn towards more urban areas rather than rural. So what is the solution for the agricultural industry here locally? Where can we look to try and meet that demand? Immigration, I believe, is going to be an important factor not just immigration to agricultural jobs, but also immigration to agriculture ownership and enterprises. Um, I think Canada with the pandemic did take a pause and interrupted its immigration flow. And that's been a very, very important part source of labor in this country, that immigration flow, but that was interrupted because of the, uh, the, the, the how we say the landed immigrant requirements for vaccines and, and fear of importing disease. And so that is being rectified. I understand the federal government is now making progress on that. And we've seen the doors reopen. They, the politicians have paid attention. But immigration is going to be an important part of the solution to agriculture, whether it be temporary or full-time workers and landed immigrants who can go into uh, food jobs, but also purchase farms, even at the entry scale level, and purchase um, processing businesses, establish their own businesses. 
um, uh, from retail to uh, uh, processing to delivery and um, primary production. So I think immigration is going to be an important solution to agriculture and agro-processing and agribusiness. And how could the government potentially make it a little bit safer for investors? Because I mean, like no matter what, starting up a business always takes a certain amount of capital and it always takes a certain amount of risk. But how could the government potentially mitigate some of those risks to potentially try and encourage more people to set up more, as they say, mom and pop farms, essentially, in, in local regions? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, our organization works with some of the financial sector. Uh, one of our sponsors, for example, is the Farm Credit Canada. And uh, we see opportunities with Farm Credit Canada ex expanding their operations, their lending si situation, their capital, not just into primary production farms, but also in the agri-food business, the agri-food processors. They're an important solution. Uh, we're also working with Fair Finance Fund here in Ontario, who are funding and lending and investing in small food businesses in rural areas. Uh, we have venture capital uh, organizations who have modest and patient return on investment expectations who are branching out. Uh, one, of my, one of our members is the Equity Investment Fund out of the Kingston area, and they're looking for investment opportunities in the agri-food sector. So I think, generally speaking, the capital sources, investors, institutional and individual investors, see the food sector as a place to invest, see the food sector as being... Um, how to say, inflation proof and always disaster proof because there's always a demand for, for food. People might pause traveling for a year or two and the airline industry hurts for that matter and, and the shares that go along with that. But the food sector is always a good place to invest. It make, requires more uh, patience, maybe a lower expectation on a rate of return, uh, but it's a very safe place to invest because there's always going to be demand and supply for food. Now you heard it there. Maybe the food industry could be your next step. There's a bunch of roles going around. So you can get in touch with Tom and any of you guys at the team there. Go onto the portal to see perhaps if shopping straight from the local farms is what's right for you and could save a little bit of money when those interest rates peak the cost of food in the new year. Now, here at TVC22, we try to bring you a roundup of the main talking points from the municipal council meetings, as you well know. A neighbouring municipality, however, has decided to take it on themselves, with Mayor Pierre Leroux from Russell taking a couple of minutes to explain their, to their residents some of the key moments from their meetings. Hi everyone, just a quick follow-up to Monday night's council meeting. Uh, three items that I wanted to mention. First, uh, council approved a new corporate communications policy. Uh, with continuous changes and expectations regarding uh, communications, staff and council felt it was very important to uh, modify and update our practices. Uh, secondly, uh, or the second item was a encroachment study. Uh, this report looks at the instances of uh, private residences that are actually encroaching on municipal property along our fitness trail. Uh, council had a, a lengthy discussion and uh, gave a direction to staff to investigate uh, further possible options to the report and to report back in the new year. Uh, thirdly, our recreational complex update. Um, this report presented options, a very sound financial plan and a timeline moving forward. Um, at this stage, Council is looking at a three pad arena, um, eight lane, uh, 25 meter pool, uh, 7,500 square foot gymnasium, and a 7,500 square foot uh, new community center. Um, we are moving forward with the creation of a conceptual plan and budget for the retrofit of the Saint Camille Pichet into a new Embram Library branch. Uh, once that conceptual plan and budget is completed, this will come back to council for final approval. If ever it doesn't work, uh, then the planned new community center space uh, could be turned back into the library space. So these are now two distinct projects uh, moving forward, uh, but uh, you know, still interconnected, but we're treating them as two new project, uh, two different projects at this time. Um, details on the financial plan are included in the report, so I invite everyone to have a look. Um, obviously, this we're still in the early stages. Uh, as we get along further in the process, we'll need to adjust accordingly, whether it's changing our budget or changing the design, 
Uh, but I am confident to say that if all goes well, uh, we will be breaking ground in 2023 and we will be using this new facility in 2025. As always, you can see all the information on the agenda package at www.russell.ca or watch the webcast through our YouTube channel. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a great day. Mayor Pierre Leroux there with the roundup of their latest council meeting. So what do you think? Maybe that's something that Mayor Zant should, should consider too. Make my job a little bit easier anyway. Uh, this past weekend, a community assembly on global environmental and ecological crisis was held at the Hammond Golf Course in Hammond. The event consisted of workshops and discussions between community members of the Prescott Russell region on how to combat climate change on a global scale, as well as a local one. Reporter Bruce de la Cruz spoke to Stephanie Marcel, one of the organizers, about how the event went and the present situation of climate action in the UCPR. I think it went well. Um, there was a lot of participation, a lot of discussion. I'm actually really pleased with the results. Um, it was quite interesting to hear the tables buzzing and, and know that people were really getting into it. And there was a lot of people that were, were um, speaking out too, which was great. Uh, can you give us a little bit of a summary of what was discussed as well? Oh my gosh, yeah. Um, really, we were debating the question today, um, how can humanity address the ecological and um, uh, climate crisis in a fair and effective way? So that's really what we were trying to get at. Um, people's feelings and, and beliefs and ideas on, on what we can do um, to, to address this together. And so during the presentations, a lot of emphasis was put on global actions, but also a lot on local action as well. So how does global uh, the climate crisis affect us here in the UCPR specifically? Oh man, well, I'm not the expert on that, but I really think that, uh, that climate change is impacting all of us, but in different ways. And that's kind of what we tried to get at at the beginning of the assembly is just to, um, to realize that everyone is experiencing climate change in a different way. And, and even though you know, here in our region, we might not be experiencing it how someone on the other side of the world is, we are all having feelings about it and we are all impacted whether we realize it or not. Um, so yeah, that's what we were really trying to get at today. Perfect, and just kind of adding on to that, uh, when people leave here today, what do you hope they'll take with them? <sighs> what, what's the point of bringing everyone together in one space? You know, I just, I really wanted to, um, to provide our community with, with the opportunity to participate in this global conversation. And I really wanted to signal to our municipal leaders um, that our community cares about this issue um, and that we realize that all levels of government need to be involved um, and that there's a lot that we can do here uh, locally within our region to take action and to participate. So I really want people to just continue this conversation when they go home and, and to just keep that momentum going because I think we're really, we're really starting to see that in, in our region. It's really important. And what, what is uh, keeping the momentum going look like on an individual level and just on a municipal level? Well, well. Keep, yeah, well, um, just keeping that conversation going. Um, there's, a, there's a group of us that are, you know, active in our communities and we're putting on events such as this. Um, you know, we're asking our, our municipal leaders to, to uh, create a climate action plan and, and to, to take action. So, I mean, you can, you can join, you can volunteer, um, you can do little things in, in your daily life, uh, make, you know, small changes in, in the way that uh, you consume um, and just think about the the crisis in general. Mm -hmm. And you did we we did a story earlier this year with uh, Lisa Deacon who was mentioning this was just at the beginning of the climate action plan and presenting it to municipalities. That was back during the summer. And uh, what's happened since then? Um, yeah. So we we've made presentations to to all the municipal councils now. Um, and we brought it forward to the UCPR Council to consider our ask, so to join the Partners for Climate Protection Program, um, to make a, um, a regional working group to help set up a, a climate action plan, and um, to start taking these actions sooner rather than later. 
Um, so they have agreed to uh, join the Partners for Climate Protection program, um, but there still is a lot of discussion on whether or not um, in the region we have the capacity to actually create a, a climate action plan. Um, so we're still working at it, we're still meeting with our leaders and, and urging this um, to go forward because it really is action that needs to happen at the municipal level. Um, so we're all here as volunteers to support um, and we're just going to keep urging our, our municipal leaders forward to, to take this action. Is there anything that you as a group can do to kind of s not speed up the process, but just kind of to, kind of to uh, yeah, I guess speed up the process, trying to talk to the municipal leaders? Yeah, I think just not, not to lose that momentum again, right? Mm -hmm. To just keep reaching out and keep pushing forward and having events such as this where we get other people engaged too, it might inspire them to contact their municipal leaders, right? The more voices that speak up about this, the louder we become, um, the more pressure they're going to feel to, to actually take action um, because they know that, that we're serious about it and that our community does care. So it's just to keep that momentum going and, and to keep our voices heard and to keep pushing and keep pushing. Uh, why do you think the municipal leaders aren't really ready to fully commit yet? That I, I, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to make any assumptions. I think we have support of a lot of our municipal leaders. We actually had a council member, um, I believe from the nation here with us today. Um, so I wouldn't want to say that we don't have their support. I think we have a lot of support, um, but as you could see from the event today, it's a very complex um, issue that we're in. And you know, it, not everyone fully understands it. Not everyone can see the path that we need to take to make change. It's mm -hmm. just so big, yeah. right? So we need to start um, breaking it into smaller pieces and seeing what's realistic for our region and what we can actually do. Perfect. And just a few more questions there, Stephanie. Uh, why is it important, again, to have these community discussions? Well, because it's our community, right? It's, it's, it's where we live and it's, you know, um, it should be a healthy and comfortable place for us. So, um, yeah, I just think it's really important to, to have that community voice heard. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, uh, second last question, where does fighting climate change start in your opinion? Where does fighting climate change start? Yeah. Well, it starts here, right? It starts at the community level. It yeah. starts with awareness. It <laughs> starts with education and conversation and creating a, a shared understanding of what's going on, not only here, but around the world, right? And, and, and creating that sense of, of empathy to understand that, you know, like I said before, everyone's experiencing it differently. <laughs> Um, so, yeah. Perfect. And thank you so much, Stephanie. I think the last thing I want to let you do is kind of give you the platform just to let uh, our viewers know what they can do slash how to get in touch with you and just some other initiatives that are coming up in your calendars. Yeah. So, um, you can contact us through, through Eco East. Uh, Meryl Fron was also here. It's a, it's a group that's active in the region. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can reach out to us if you'd like to volunteer, if you'd like to get, um, get active, um, write to your, your uh, municipal leaders, you know, demand, demand climate action. Um, we've also got um, the uh, UCPR official plan review coming up. Um, so that's how our region uh, will set forward to develop over the next 30 years. So making sure that we're taking considerations, environmental considerations in when, when we're talking about how we are going to develop and transform our region. Um, so yeah, just, just keep, the, keep the conversation going and get involved as much as you can. And um, if you can't get involved, you know, make one small change in your life, one little thing um, to acknowledge that, you know, you, you understand what's going on and you want to participate and be part of the change. Perfect. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. So that's it for this week. As ever, if there's a story within the community that you think needs a little more light shined on, then you can reach out to us. You can get in touch by calling the station. You can reach me at extension number four, or you can email me at nouvelle with an S at the end at tvc22.ca. So that's a wrap on 2021. 
Thank you very much for being part of the journey and tuning in to all of our shows across all of our different platforms. We'll be back, hopefully bigger and most definitely better in the new year. So for now, it's good morning from me. It's good morning from the team and we'll see you next year. Happy holidays. Goodbye.